A recent um, survey discovered that 36% of American 18 to 34 year olds check their Facebook or Twitter account after sex. <laughs> you may have missed that. So uh, Twitter evidently is the new cigarette. I mean, we've entered, <laughs> we've entered a different era here. And the other survey of Germans in their, in their 20s, 84% said they would give up their significant other rather than give up their connection to the internet. Woo. But the good news is 84%, that means it was pretty much equal on both sides of the deal. Um, and when they pursued the question a little farther, well, why that? They said, well, you can always find a significant other, <laughs> but there's only one internet. So, and this one more thing on Melito, Italy, a small town in Italy uh, that had just received its money from, um, uh, from the central government for the year, decided, and they scheduled the commission actually put this together, it's in, the, it's in their annual um, plan, that each week they would buy tickets um, to the lottery with their money. And their argument was the lottery is much better than the um, crapshoot, and that was their term, crapshoot that is the equities market. <laughs> so I think one of the things that comes out of that is things are changing. Some things are being forced to change by the dynamics that are in the marketplace, and some things are changing simply because of developments in, the, um, in fields. Different topics that we think are relevant and important um, to understand what's going on in the world. I want to today kind of look at just three of them, really and how they feed into a larger topic. Permeable borders, new industrial revolution, digital world. Permeable borders, all boundaries, borders, barriers, categories, beliefs, values, and concepts seem threatened. And that's just a pretty simple statement of a pretty wide and challenging reality, I think. The uh, significant changes in the marketplace, the new industrial revolution, power moves to the individual institutions challenged. And the last, the digital world, so operational, sociological, and psychological changes that are being driven by digital technology. When we put these together, the, permeable, the battle over permeable borders, the new industrial revolution as it plays out, and the digital world, we get into what we call the rethinking everything model. So we start with the permeable borders. This is a kind of an outline of where we see some of these battles taking place on, around individual lifestyles and lives, the nation states, nature, and institutions themselves, and then some of the battles that are being fronted. So wherever there is a topic there, there's a conflict going on between those who would knock down traditional barriers or acceptable barriers or acceptable concepts and those who would like to save those boundaries. And that's what we call the battle of permeable borders. So you just imagine the equivalent of immigration uh, out of Mexico and the United States, and that's fine, that's a good movement for some people, it recognizes economic change and so on. For others, it's a threat to the culture, and they want to build a wall along Texas. Uh, so that's, you just kind of spread that around, and um, you have what we call this battle over permeable borders. Certainly nature, kind of the model for us is the goby fish in the Great Lakes, and since we're right here, you probably know about the goby fish, which was an invasive species brought in the ballast of a ship from the Caspian Sea, and in about five months it spread throughout the f all five lakes because there was no um, predator that could ease them, and, that, and it totally destabilized the environment in the water. And it took years for that to get straightened out, then zebra mussels came and so on. It's in a constant state of destabilization, the, the Great Lakes, and, and finding a new balance and finding where places are and who lives what and who has power and so on. It goes on constantly, and that to us is kind of the metaphor of what's going on in general, whether it's terrorism doing that in, in politically or whether it's something else. So the nature to us, the ecosystems, the models seem to be the kind of metaphor for the whole problem. Nations and states, currencies, for example, I like Malaysia's former Prime Minister Mahathir who said that currency traders are financial terrorists because they cross boundaries, they cross borders, and they affect the economies without actually being in those economies. And so, but it's a different shift, a different, if you're a victim of that sort of play, and if you're a Cougaran in South Africa, you had some problems re related to what was going on in London. Nothing changed for the people. They were working hard in South Africa, and all of a sudden their imports cost 40% more. So he calls them financial terrorists, but it, it just sets up all these things. 
Um, outer space is now, there are no boundaries in outer space and there are 40 countries that now have satellites and there are issues there as to who's watching what all over the place all the time. China just said they're sending up a satellite to, for Bolivia. I, you know, Bolivia can pretty much watch itself. I don't, you know, it, <laughs> but it's going to have a satellite. And so the question is, what is that satellite and what is China contributing to it? And um, so the whole idea of where boundaries and borders are seems to be getting challenged across the board. Institutions, you know, all you have to do is say mashup and you're really talking about a totally different product that was created from other products, boundaries being crossed. Just mention the music industry and the kind of, they thought they had control of their products and they went from having an album as a product to single songs to a product to a ringtone for a product. I mean, no, that was not the scale that they wanted to do. They wanted to go the other direction. For medicine, traveling to India to get surgery and coming back, there's a new virus that is, I mean, a new bacterium that's spreading in London hospitals that is, um, antibiotic immune um, because it was created in India, came back after the operation and they can't stop it. And so the whole idea of all these boundaries and borders getting knocked down, triggering transitions and triggering challenges and destabilizing environments where they come into play is really what we think a very uh, interesting um, phenomenon. And the last example, uh, individuals. It's just this one woman, a 16 year old English girl lost her job because she put on Facebook that she it said, I'm bored. And the next day she got fired. I guess she's not bored now. It just seems that there, there's nothing that's not open to open access, and that re creates boundaries being knocked down in terms of privacy and what's, uh, what's not available to the public and so on. Job status, people used to think if they worked hard and worked extra or something, they would A, get a salary increase, and B, had job security. They got neither now. They work really hard, and your job still may go overseas or something. So the whole idea of international movement of goods and services and jobs destabilizes, certainly has destabilized the job market in this country. So that whole kind of context of the, of the boundaries and borders breaking down or being challenged and wanting to resurrect them, we think is an ongoing issue and it ends up, you know, something will pop up in politics about immigrants or something and we just say, yeah, you missed it. You know, it's just, there's a bigger issue going on that's not stoppable and the question is, will, you know, government and companies ever catch up uh, to what's actually going on? The second uh, topic, uh, the new industrial revolution, significant changes in the marketplace. This is the full layout of it, um, and we'll kind of break it down, look in smaller pieces. It starts on the left, and everyone remembers their Economics 101 or their Marx and Philosophy or something course, that the power migrates to command and control of labor, technology, capital, and raw materials. That is really the beginning of the industrial revolution, when you can have the machinery that replaces hand labor for efficiency, and you can conquer the labor force, put them in, in, in relationship to the machine rather than in relationship to their handcraft, and also own the natural resources necessary for that, and you own the transportation. You own all that, you begin to have leverage. And over many years, you have these behemoth companies being formed that have total control over those uh, particular products. And so the producer moves into position of power. And the producer owns institutions which generate products that get sold out in the marketplace. In the 20th century, though, that began to shift. Uh, when, we, when you take a look at what happened um, in what we call this power migrates to controllers of distribution capabilities as producers proliferate, proliferate globally, production technology became cheap and it became transportable and became movable. So you could put your factory any place in the world wherever the labor was cheapest or closest to the natural resources or wherever there was a good transportation system and so on and so forth, and you could generate those literally worldwide. And all of a sudden the power moved away from being able to produce these things cheaply and rapidly, and it moved to the person who had the connection with the customer. And so the retailer or distributor began to have the leverage in the marketplace. Producers lost their price, fat pricing capabilities. They lost their ability to connect with the customer. They created brands to try and make it happen. But the reality was they had lost connection to the retailer who had the connection. So you have these huge companies, eventually uh, the consummate huge company being Walmart, that can dictate prices back to the producer. Power market cap moves to electronic distribution. The model, you know, the killer app was not some particular project. The killer app became who's going to connect me to the Internet. And that gave great leverage, gave market capital and all this other stuff. And so if you had connections to the sources, then you, you had this brief little window before it collapsed of, of capability. 
But what moves ahead then is the distribution competition squeezes distributor and power moves to the consumer. The same thing that happened to the producers happened to the distributors. There were so many producers that distributors could play one against the other for price advantage. All of a sudden with the internet, catalog, phone, and all the, other, and all the different uh, malls around the world, there was a proliferation of distributors. So now the consumer could play one distributor off against another for price. So we've circled all the way back to the beginning to almost to the pre-industrial revolution, back when individual artisans made shoes or tables or whatever and then sold it locally. You now have individuals who can make a movie, but unlike the sell it local, the artisan, they can now put it on the internet and distribute it worldwide. That's a huge market movement that is changing the dynamic and all of a sudden you have all these people offering stuff for free because they're trying to get around the reality that they're losing leverage in the marketplace. Just to take one example, you can invent a cool product, visit the US Patent and Trademark Office websites to see if it's been done for, email to your friends for modifications. You could crowdsource the invitation, I mean the invention, you can go out there and say give me some ideas, well I like that one, I think I'll do that one. You then go to the design function. You can use free tools like Blender or Google SketchUp to create a 3D digital model of your invention or search websites for something that can be modified. Um, then you can go and get funded by going to Kickstarter or Zopa for financing, or you can crowdsource your financing, crowdfund as the bands are doing. Just go out there and get the money first and then produce it and then make sure that the people who gave you the money get the first products. So you can crowdfund these things. So you don't really need a bank anymore. Then you can go to the prototype and you can create a prototype using a desktop 3D printer which can sell by my master bot, by maker bot by around $1,000 and upload your file and the printer will print out a three-dimensional product. Say if you have the ultimate spatula, that's just the world is waiting for this spatula and you've got a design, you turn that design into a maker bot and it will produce a three-dimensional version of that. That by the way is being used to produce human organs. There are three-dimensional printers now that can print out organs. Okay. <laughs> so when you, when you go get that, say, did a maker bot make this thing? Or, or, there are issues. There are issues. And through this whole thing, branding, oh man, if you weren't being branded, I mean, that was, you just were out of it. So you had corporations branding, and, and then there were rebranding. A lot of these advertising agencies, no longer advertising agencies, they're branding agencies now. So you have this whole movement because there has to be something to overcome this system. This system is driving the leverage from producer to distributor to the customer, and you have to have something to get the customer back interested in what the producer is producing, what the distributor is distributing, and so on. And so brands. The last one, the digital world. And what we see are kind of three areas of influence upon society. One is the operational effects, and of course the business and, and individuals are all over that. Things that will make things more efficient. Greater access, greater co connection to uh, information, greater shortcuts and so on to getting things done, efficiency, all those things happen. and that's pretty well established. We're just now starting to see a few studies on the sociological impact, that is the way in which we interact and how the digital world is changing that. And this constant connectivity becoming a norm, and certainly with pervasive computing becoming soon to be wearable computing, soon to be implanted computing, you really have an issue of who, what's human, who's human, and how are we interacting, not only with machines, but with each other. That's being discussed, but not discussed in, in great detail or with what we would consider any kind of a discipline. What we're just now seeing also are good examples of the psychological effects. You know, we now have London's got one, the United States got one, China, uh, no, yeah, China, Korea, and Taiwan all have addiction centers for a, a digital addiction. What we're concerned about is what we call digital obesity. And that is the way in which, you know, eating food and eating food was fine, and all of a sudden we got a diabetes issue. Internet's fine, internet's fine, internet's fine, all of a sudden what? What, what is it there? Maybe there's nothing but it's not being discussed. Psychologists are just now beginning to study this issue, and we're watching it pretty closely, but we've already seen what we call the short message brain, and that is that the willingness to tolerate long messages, including these speeches, but you're doing well. <laughs> the digital technology, the new industrial revolution, and the battle over permeable borders are creating these kinds of things as a day-to-day -day existence. Anxiety is going up. I mean, there are surveys that are done in college students all the way going back to 38. Anxiety is over the top right now compared to all the surveys they've done since 1938. 
They feel more isolated, they feel more pressure, and so on and so forth. Conflict going on, certainly anger is out there right now over Wall Street, Congress, President, immigrants, you know, you name it. There's a, somebody's mad at somebody. Vulnerability, joblessness, and so on, uncertainty, volatility. It's fascinating just uh, going through this list, and there are several types of interesting examples to talk about there, but that is a very uncomfortable environment. And it leads to scapegoating. It can lead to a lot of things because people would love to have one solution, would love to have one solution to everything. And certainly the political institutions are trying to exploit that capability and make it one issue. And then make it, but this is much more complex. It is systemic, it is society-wide, it is global, and it's not going away. And so we see that as both an opportunity and a risk for our clients. Various things that are being rethought. It's pretty much at the fundamental level in all fields, academic fields, education, society, lifestyles, identity. All these things are challenged and forcing people to rethink what they are, who they are, and what they believe. So I feel pretty good. I don't... <laughs> Thank you.